this is my new 2012 Mercedes-Benz E63 AMG wagon. I bought it to replace my ancient Range Rover and be my new daily driver, and I revealed it in a video in a column a few weeks ago. I figured I'd show it to you, tell you a little bit about it, and then move on and keep filming with other cars like I usually do, but instead, that video got over a million views basically overnight, and it reached number 11 on YouTube trending. So there's clearly a lot of interest in this thing, even though it's just a station wagon. So with that in mind, today I'm going to give you a more in-depth tour of my new E63 wagon. Before I do that, let me go over some of the details for those of you who missed it. My wagon has a 5.5 liter twin turbocharged V8 mated to a seven speed automatic transmission and rear wheel drive. It has 518 horsepower and 516 pound feet of torque. 518 horsepower and 516 pound feet in a family wagon designed for carrying luggage and school children and pets and a 56 pack of paper towels back from Costco so the owner could save $6 by buying in bulk. It'll do zero to 60 in 4.2 seconds. Now, I paid around $44,500 to buy my AMG wagon, plus an extra $3,500 to extend the Mercedes-Benz certified pre-owned warranty for an additional two years, giving me three total years of bumper-to-bumper -bumper unlimited mileage warranty coverage, which I'm very excited about. This car had about 53,000 miles on it when I got it, and I have already added about 2,000 miles in the last two months, most of which came from driving it back from Minneapolis, where I bought it. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of it and show you all of its weird quirks and cool features, and then I'm going to get it out on the road and tell you how it drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on my first two months with my AMG wagon, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of some other high-performance practical cars you can currently buy on Autotrader with a certified pre-owned warranty. I'm going to start this with one of the more interesting features of the AMG wagon. That would be the night vision system. Yes, that's right. This car has night vision. Basically, how it works is you push a little button to the left of the steering wheel, and then the center infotainment screen screen is replaced with a night vision camera. Now, I've talked to a lot of AMG wagon owners about this, and they all say it's useless, it's a stupid feature, and I'm not even really sure if Mercedes still offers it, but I actually really like it. On dark country roads at night, when cars are coming towards you, their lights can often be blinding, but the night vision camera dims them, and it makes it easier to see where the center line is and if any deer or any other cars are coming behind them. Next up, one of this car's weirdest quirks, especially in a Mercedes Benz that's designed to be serious and not full of weirdness, that would be the shifter. Now, the shifter in itself is kind of a weird operation. You press a button for park, and then you move it between reverse, neutral, and drive. That's a little strange in itself. The shape of the shifter is also really weird, and on top of it, they have the AMG logo, which is this weird, complicated crest, but none of that is the strangest thing about the shifter. The strange thing about the shifter is you can stick your fingers through it. It's hollow. I have no idea why this is, why they designed it to look this way. I'm sure they did a lot of focus groups and studies to figure it out, but personally, I just think it's really strange. Next up, I gotta tell you about the single most annoying thing about my entire AMG wagon, and that would be the steering wheel buttons. Allow me to explain. On the right side of the steering wheel, you have the buttons to answer and hang up a phone call and to raise and lower the volume of the stereo. Fine, that makes sense. On the left side, you have the buttons to scroll through the various different menus and settings on the gauge cluster in the center, which is configurable but you don't have a button to change to the next stereo track. This is incredibly annoying. Every other car has a button to change to the next stereo track. I bet the Nissan Versa has a button to change to the next stereo track, but this car doesn't. Now, I grant you, if you go to the music menu in the gauge cluster, you can use the steering wheel buttons to change the stereo track, but then that means you can't look at anything else in the gauge cluster. This is just infuriating to me. Why did they do this? Mercedes has been doing this for years. You change the volume, but not the track. If I could fill out a JD Power survey about this car, I would give it a 10 in everything, and I'd give it a minus 4 million in steering wheel buttons. Now, that's something I don't like in this car, but here's something I really love. That would be the active seat bolsters. This may be something you've never heard of before, and I have no idea how to show this, but here's the little button to turn it on and off. The way this works is this. When you're going around a corner, the seat bolsters inflate and deflate in order to keep you positioned in your seat. That way you don't have to sit there in some crazy tight sports seat all the time, but you also don't flop around when you're going around a corner. Instead, the seat actively becomes a sports seat when you're in a tight corner, and then it goes back to being a luxury seat when you're not. I thought this was a really stupid gimmick at first, but I've used it now the entire time I've had this car, and I love it. I really wish I could get this feature in every car. I mean it.
Now back to a couple more features I don't really love all that much. One of them is the command wheel. Now command is the name of Mercedes infotainment system. That's an acronym and God only knows what German crap it stands for. The wheel in the middle is how you're supposed to control it, except in my car that wheel is already broken. You turn it and nothing happens. Fortunately, you can also move it side to side and go through the menu. So I've been able to get by, but I suspect this will be my first warranty repair. Another thing I don't like is this USB port in the center console. USB port in the center console seems like a reasonable thing. You can plug your phone in, charge it up, play your music on the infotainment system. Not so fast. You can't charge your phone with that USB port. It's data only. So it'll play your music or go through your pictures, but it won't actually charge your phone. Data only. I looked it up in the owner's manual and it says that, which is ridiculous to me. Mercedes-Benz in 2012 even should have known that people would want to charge their phones in the USB port. Now back to something else I love about this car. That would be the wheels. I covered this in my last video, so bear with me. The AMG wagon comes standard with 19-inch wheels, but it was an option that you could special order 18-inch wheels wheels if you lived in a market with rough roads. And that's what the original owner of this car did. These wheels are 18s. They're a little bit smaller. Initially, I suspect the reason that they did that was so they could fit snow tires on it, as I will do. But it also increases ride comfort. When I first posted the video revealing this car, I got a lot of emails and tweets and Facebook messages from people. Oh, you got to put bigger wheels on there. You got to get 22s on there. Make it more aggressive. But if you're saying that, you're missing the point. This car is supposed to be subtle. It's supposed to be a sleeper. It's a family station wagon that can outrun a Corvette. You're not supposed to know what it is until it's already five car lengths ahead of you and you can't catch up anymore. And I think the small wheels actually contribute to that look. Personally, if I could go with even smaller wheels, I probably would. I like them that much. And I think they're a real benefit to the overall appearance of this car. Back to the thing I don't like about this car. I also covered this in the last video. That would be the interior color beige with a brown dashboard and a brown steering wheel. Now, I love the sleeper exterior just finished in white. And I love the small wheels, but beige with brown is taking that a little bit far. If I could change anything about this car, aside from that next track button on the steering wheel, I would give it a black interior which is what it should have had in the first place. Then again, if it had a black interior, I strongly suspect it wouldn't have sat on the dealer lot for three months and I wouldn't have been able to pick it up for only 44.5. Another thing I don't like about this car, that would be the hood ornament. I can't believe in the modern era, Mercedes-Benz is still doing hood ornaments. I'm driving down the street in this thing and I'm looking out over the three-pointed star sticking up from my hood and I feel like I'm some rich jerk who's going to get the peasants out of the way of my Mercedes-Benz. Now, interestingly, the hood ornament flops around. You can move it in any direction you like. I filmed a Cadillac Eldorado from 1977 a few weeks ago and I suspected that was because otherwise you could easily steal the hood ornament, but people corrected me. It turns out the real reason it flops around is there's a federal regulation that says that a hood ornament has to be able to bend and fold so if you hit a pedestrian it doesn't injure them as badly and so any car with a hood ornament you'll see that it has the ability to fold and bend or in the case of Rolls-Royce retract so that it doesn't hurt pedestrians. Another interesting quirk of all AMG models, now AMG claims their engines are still hand-built, and to prove that, they have a little plaque on the engine cover showing the name of the guy who built the engine, including in this car's case. So thank you, Kevin Bubeck, for making my engine so that I can floor it between stoplights here in Philly. Now, something else you might find interesting, if you look closely at the windshield wipers, you'll notice that they have tiny little Mercedes-Benz logos on them. As if the hood ornament wasn't enough for you to brag about your Mercedes-Benz status, they've also put it on the wipers. Although I have to admit, I think that little subtle Mercedes-Benz logo on the wipers actually kind of looks cool. I like that it's there. Mercedes got me. Now, if you look closely on the back wiper, you'll still see that tiny Mercedes logo back there, which I'm embarrassed to admit I think is kind of cool. One of the things you won't see back here, parking sensors. The E63 AMG wagon didn't offer them. They weren't an option. They weren't standard. You couldn't get parking sensors in this car. And pop open the tailgate and you will find there is no third row back here. I get this question more than any other. Do you have a third row? Well, I had an 07 E63 wagon that did have a rear facing third row, but beginning with this body style, they got rid of it in the E63. Now I've heard conflicting explanations for why they didn't put a third row or parking sensors on this car because both features were optional in the regular E-Class station wagon. I've heard that the spare is down here and it's too big in the AMG because it has larger wheels to fit the third row or the parking sensors. I've also heard the larger exhaust meant that they couldn't get those things back here. But either way, no third row and unfortunately no parking sensors in this car. Now, one of the most interesting things back here is the cargo cover. In most cars, when you open the tailgate, the cargo cover is attached with a string or something and it pulls up as the tailgate pulls up to give you room to load your stuff in. In this car, it's not attached and yet it pulls up anyway, maybe electronically or maybe it's magic. Now, I like the cargo cover. I think it's cool. Obviously, it hides my stuff and I think cargo covers in general are a good idea in wagons. But the weird thing about this one is when you're driving down the road, it flops around 
around every single time you go over a bump. Take a look at this. Watch it flop as I drive down the street. Floppy, floppy cargo cover. You'd think they would have engineered the floppiness out of the cargo cover considering this is a $100,000 car, but well, apparently they didn't. Now, sensor around back, where, by the way, you can see my temporary license plate still, because even though I bought this car 59 days ago, I still don't have the title yet. Oh, and by the way, the Minnesota temporary license plate has the full name, address, and phone number of the person who purchased the car, and you're supposed to stick it in your back window. So if you live in Minnesota and you buy a new car, you drive around with your full address in your back window. This is the kind of thing that could only happen in the Midwest. Oh, it's no problem. Nobody's going to do anything to you with your name in the back window. Anyway, moving on from that rant. Now, this car has some cool quirks and features, as I've already showed you, and you and I view this as a high-performance car, ultra-fast car with an amazing exhaust note. But this isn't just a high performance car. When you think about the performance and the horsepower and the sound, you kind of forget the fact that this is also a ultra practical wagon. It has some really practical quirks, which I'm now going to show you. Starting with the fact that even though this is a 520 horsepower car that is 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds, it still has a power tailgate. It also has one of the coolest tailgate features that I've seen. Every car has a button on the power tailgate to lower the tailgate automatically, obviously. But this one also has a separate button that says lock on it. Well, that's because if you've just gotten your groceries out of the car, you can press the lock button, it shuts the tailgate and locks the car. That means you don't have to just shut the tailgate and then get the key fob out of your pocket and then lock the car. I've never seen any other cars aside from Mercedes-Benz models that have that feature on the power tailgate. It gives you the choice between whether you just want to shut the tailgate or whether you want to shut it and lock it. But every car should have that feature. It's really useful. Another practicality quirk, inside the rear seat there is a special compartment for the rear armrest. You open it up and inside this compartment there is another compartment with some storage. You open that up and there is another compartment for the cup holders. The rear armrest in this thing is so practical that it's like one of those Russian dolls. It just keeps opening to reveal more stuff where you can put things. Moving on for more practicality, this car has cargo space everywhere. Obviously there is a huge cargo area with little nets on the side where you can store stuff if you don't want them to roll around. There's a big back seat with a middle seat. There's a lot of space back there and there are door pockets all around. But even after doing all of that, Mercedes was like, eh, let's make it even more practical. And so they stuck a little hidden storage compartment under the passenger seat and they stuck a little hidden storage compartment under the driver's seat. This car is so practical that it has all of those cargo areas and it even has in the front passenger footwell a little storage net for more cargo. And that little storage net has a little strap on the top that keeps your cargo in place. This car is almost too practical. It can do everything. It has to be the most practical 520 horsepower car in existence. It's like that kid near high school who was the captain of the football team and also he was really attractive. And then you got to graduation and it turned out he was the valedictorian too. And you were so annoyed and infuriated because he could do everything. And you were just that weirdo who wore white t-shirts under regular t-shirts. Uh, yeah. Anyway, back to the back. Another cool thing, this car doesn't have one of those automatic release buttons for the rear seats like some modern high-end luxury SUVs, but it does let you release the rear seats from the cargo area. Just pull this and the rear seat folds down so that you can put more cargo in it. Another cool thing about this car with its endless practicality, when you drop the rear seat, the front seat whirs forward so that the rear seat has enough room to go all the way flat so that you can get as much cargo in the back as you possibly can. Take a look. Not bad. Next up, I have somehow managed to cut myself during the filming of this review. I swear this was not intentional, but this car is so practical that it includes a Mercedes-Benz first aid kit. So, I will now tend to my wound. Yeah, it's a nice, nice bib. Perfect, now I can continue. And one more impressive piece of practicality, this car has a built-in rear sunshade. Lift it up, and then you can stick it in place. That way, if you have an infant in the back seat who's especially light sensitive, you don't have to use some aftermarket solution. It's already right there, so you can shade them from the sun. Now, there are also a couple of other interesting things unique to my particular wagon. For instance, look in the driver's side door jam, and you will notice that I have a fast pass for the Cobblestone Auto Spa in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. If my AMG wagon ever gets dirty, I can just drive on down to Phoenix and get $3 off my next detail at the Cobblestone Auto Spa. 
pretty good situation, huh? The other interesting thing about my particular wagon is the V8 bi-turbo badge on the passenger fender looks completely normal until you get to the O. It's just a little off kilter. Now this car has never been in an accident, it's never had any paintwork, it's just that O that's a little off. Now this would drive a lot of car enthusiasts crazy, but I am going to leave it because this car is my daily driver and I suspect that will be the only imperfection. If you correct that one to make the car perfect, then you get a little ding and you freak out and you correct that and I don't want to be chasing that kind of stuff. I don't want to be the type of guy who goes to Target with his 90 four year old grandparents and then I park two miles from the entrance just so I can get an end spot in the shade so no one will ding my car. That's not me. I'm going to drive this thing. I'm going to use it in all conditions in all types of weather throughout the next three years and you're going to see a lot of videos with it and I'm definitely not going to worry about a little O on the fender badge. Okay so those are the quirks and features of my AMG wagon. Now it's time to get it out on the street and let you know what I think of the driving experience after I've spent about 2,000 miles behind the wheel. <laughs> I love the sound. That was one of the first things I got in. I'm in comfort mode right now. In fact, I spend most of my time driving in comfort mode. It's already harsh enough, the suspension, and the car is fast enough. It doesn't need to be put in any sport modes. Um, and uh, I love the sound. I mean, it, it sounds like I'm in a real sports car and something even beyond that. It sounds like I'm in an old 60s muscle car. The ride quality is pretty harsh, uh, harsher than I was expecting, honestly. And this car is really great around corners. It's actually really, really impressive. I mean, I feel like it handles up there with Porsches from not that long ago, but uh, the, the downside is that, I mean, you get thrown around even in comfort suspension mode. I like the feel of everything in the interior. I, I'm a little bit disappointed. The center stack plastics are a little bit cheap looking. Uh, but generally speaking, the interior is pretty nice and everything feels good. And even after 50 whatever thousand miles, this car doesn't have any rattles or shakes or creaks. And that's important to me. I love the acceleration. <laughs> it just feels so good. It's so quick. Uh, I just love it. <laughs> I, I can't stop. The acceleration, by the way, is surprisingly smooth. It's a turbocharged car, but it is twin turbocharged, and that helps it be a little bit more linear. I suspect if I were in a city where the roads were a little bit better, uh, it would be more comfortable to drive day to day. And the Northeast has some of the worst roads in the United States, and that, that plus the harsh suspension contributes to sort of an uncomfortable feeling. Um, the thing I think is that it's cool about this car is only a few people know. And when they do know, they freak out, right? When I see one of these on the street, even now that I have this car, I freak out. This is the kind of car that a lot of people say they're going to buy and never follow through. It's unbelievable to me how many people have come to me, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at AMG wagons. I'm thinking about buying an AMG wagon for my family. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, I talk to them months later, oh, I got an M-Class. This is the stereotypical car that people say they're gonna buy and don't actually buy. Oh, I want a fast wagon, oh, a fast wagon. And then they actually make one and people are like, ah, yeah, I can't, can't do that, don't want that. One thing I don't like is that the transmission kind of hesitates uh, from the get-go from a stop. It's actually kind of annoying to me. The transmission shifts very smoothly, very well. You can barely tell that it's operating. When you floor it, it downshifts quickly, even though it's not in dual clutch, but just away from a stop, it feels a little bit too shaky. I mentioned before, but it really annoys me that this car doesn't have backup uh, sensors and, and even a 360 camera would be amazing. But even just backup sensors, everybody had backup sensors in 12. It wasn't even optional in this car. I think it's ridiculous. Handling and steering, I've been tremendously impressed with. Um, I have friends with older 911s, 996s, and, and I swear it's, it's almost on that level. Obviously it's a big car, so it's not gonna be quite on that level, but there have been a lot of improvements in suspension technology in the last 15 years. And, uh, and it feels really, really sharp. The driving experience in general is probably the thing that I'm most impressed with by this car. Between the acceleration, the sound, and the handling, uh, I, I'm blown away. I always said that the AMG wagon felt more like a wagon and the CTS V wagon felt more like a sports car. And I think this body AMG wagon actually does maybe the best job combining them both. So that's my E63 AMG wagon, my new daily driver. Really though, it's more of my winter daily driver because while it's still warm out, while it's still the summer, I've been driving my 1997 Land Rover Defender 90 virtually every day. And I won't stop doing that until it gets basically too cold to drive it. At which point I will switch over to the wagon. So basically, I have bought this 520 horsepower rear wheel drive AMG car to drive when it gets cold and snowy. I'm sure there are many more videos to come. Anyway, I like my AMG wagon so far. It's practical, it's fun to drive, and it's a special car. Now, a few of you have pointed out that a couple of years ago, I reviewed a brand new AMG wagon and I said I would never buy one of these. But keep in mind, I was talking about a brand new model with a price tag of around $100,000. It's a very different story when you can pick one of these up for around $48,000 and have three years of unlimited mileage bumper to bumper warranty from Mercedes-Benz. Anyway, time to give my AMG wagon a Doug score. 
Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the E63 wagon is clearly an attractive car. I personally think it's beautiful, just the right amount of subtle, but I'm not crazy enough to think everyone else shares my opinion. Still, I think we'd all agree it's at least a little above average, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration is strong, 0 to 60 is in the low 4 second range, which earns it a 7 out of 10. Handling is good, amazing for a wagon, but the Doug score compares everything together, and it can't touch the best sports cars. Still, it remains above average, earning a 6 out of 10, which is great, especially for its size. Next up is Cool Factor. Now, when I see one of these at Cars and Coffee, I get all excited and I run over to it, but I know most people just see it as a normal wagon. Still, virtually all car enthusiasts get that this is something special, and it's cool enough to earn a 7 out of 10. Importance, however, isn't high. This is just another generation of AMG wagon. There were some before it, and there will be more after it, and it earns a 6 out of 10. Still add it all up, and the total weekend score is 32 out of 50, which places it really high for something that isn't a really fast sports car. Next up are the daily categories and features. The E63 is really well equipped with radar cruise control and night vision and such, but I mean, where's that steering wheel next track button? That alone drops it from an 8 to a 7 out of 10. Comfort is good, but harsher than I'd expect for a Mercedes wagon, even an ultra-fast Mercedes wagon, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality measures reliability and materials. Both are good, but neither is amazing. Reliability is strong for this generation, but I mean, there's a reason I chose the warranty. And materials are nice, but they could be better, especially the plastic center control stack. It earns a 7 out of 10. Next up is practicality. The AMG wagon has 59 cubic feet of cargo space, and fuel economy isn't so bad as I've been able to achieve 20 miles per gallon on the highway, so it easily earns an 8 out of 10. Finally, value is strong. $48,000 is a pretty good deal for this car with three years of bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, but it still has quite a bit of depreciating left to do, limiting the score to a 7 out of 10. Add it all together, and the total daily score is 36 out of 50, placing it number 4, exactly where it belongs, as this is a great daily driver. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is... 68 out of 100, placing it near the very top, which is exactly where you'd expect to find it. The Doug score seems to favor excellent exotic cars like the 488 and the Huracan, or fast, practical luxury cars like the Bentayga and the Model X, and the AMG wagon certainly fits into that latter group. Warranty repair. Another thing that I don't like, I don't remember. It's like the center armrest is one of those Russian dolls that just has smaller and smaller compartments inside each time you open it.